Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's session. Sorry about Thursday. I uh, meant to change that. I had some kind of some last minute things pop up and uh, never did get a recording out either. So I apologize about that. So we'll cover as much as we can here today and see if there's anything that we need to kind of backfill for last Thursday. Uh, let's jump in and talk about uh, current market conditions right here. And let me just make sure I've got uh yeah audio video should be good right here we've seen uh, really an impressive rally here this last week really a, a a surprising rally but the economic data and the data that the that the market has been wanting uh, has kind of presented itself so it at one point we had uh, some fear coming into the market regarding maybe recession and, and no ability to or or cutting interest rates based on recession versus cutting interest rates based on inflation uh, those two are right now in the market's minds very different things the recession or the look of a of a, of a soft landing if you ever hear that term soft landing typically when the, when the fed has to raise interest rates let me actually jump over to this chart while we're talking about this because this is this is still a story this is still not going away Okay, the fact that we have this inversion in the yield curve is is that still has to correct itself. Now, a soft landing is that when it does start to correct itself, or the fact that it's been high, that these short-term rates have been high for so long, it affects the economy. And that's what the Fed has to do to control inflation. It's got to break some things to slow down the spending. It's got to take money out of the system so that there's less money um, chasing these goods during during, you know, right after COVID, we had this massive flood of capital into the system, both with stimulus as well as low interest rates for a point, for a purpose. And that was to hold up or to support the economy because, you know, we were all we were all in masks, we were all at home, we weren't spending our money. And so the Fed kind of had to force us to go out and or not necessarily force us, but compel us to go out, us and companies as well, consumers and companies to go spend money so that we, you know, things could grow and the that that overshot. Okay. So that ultimately created this big rally. We get we end up getting a counter trend or a correction of that. And during that entire cycle, while interest rates were moving lower, in fact, let me go back to that chart. If I were to put this sitting right about here. And we go back to COVID. Okay, the bottom of that COVID low right there. Look what interest rates were at. Basically zero. Okay, they were zero all the way out to the two-year, even the five-year. So 30-year. So you know, if you remember, we were all griping about our, you know, our checking and savings account basically earning nothing, and you couldn't put the money in the bank for a five-year CD. You know, for for anything, it was earning you less than a percent. So the incentive was also to go into uh, riskier assets like equities. So lots of stimulus, lots of reasons to put money into different places. And now the fact that we that that has happened, we we're now dealing with this side of the yield curve. So the issue that with a soft landing is, are we going to see economic slowdown because the rates have been so high for so long? That's really what's starting to want to happen in the market. Uh, also with the inflation number. So when we see a CPI number, the consumer price index number, or we're seeing anything that has to do with pricing and wages, inflation, uh, all of those different things, those are the markets paying attention to those. So the last few reports have been positive regarding lower inflation and increased productivity in the economy no recession essentially a recession is just a slowdown okay so all of you know all of the growth that's happening in the economy if that starts to slow down then we get a we, we just get a slowdown of that growth and so it re, we get a recessionary period of time and typically those don't last very long now the now now that's what we're dealing that's what the market is really trying to pay attention to right now is are we going to see a slowdown in in uh, in economic growth. Now, why does that matter? It matters because stocks are tied to companies, right? And we're anticipating, we're putting a premium on growth. And if that 
if that premium starts to be, uh, you know, starts to be questionable whether or not the e the economy is going to grow, whether or not these companies can grow, then the stock price, the market is going to say, oh wow, well, they're more than likely this company is not going to grow at the same rate. We need to revalue the stock prices and we need to sell them, sell them off, or we need to buy more, or there's you're, you're getting these large institutions that are essentially revaluing what stock prices look like. So we've, we've got a little bit of a flavor for that, but it didn't last very long, but not a whole lot has changed. So I, I wanna come back to this chart just to help us keep some perspective of where we're at with interest rates because it still matters. They haven't moved much uh, and we're still at the upper end of a really nice long-term trend. It's looking like we could get some kind of a blow off top, some kind of a capitulation towards the upside, just a lot of pent up uh, FOMO, fear of missing out towards this trend right here. Okay, now that being said, let's jump in and look at some of these indicators here. The short-term trends, we saw this momentum. We're back into this bullish momentum zone uh, on the market as a whole. Uh, we saw that deeply oversold. It rallied back just really sharply. Breadth also uh, oversold, rallying back. Not you know nothing too uh, exuberant. We're not we're not at an extreme on breadth but we are positive. And then sentiment also, which is related to the VIX, as I've mentioned, those fear indications. When you start to see fear or panic come in, you start to see this indicator shift. Well, look what happened. It immediately has recovered, just like the market. So that, that fear is not, it, there's not a lot of it. It's not pent up. It lasted for a short amount of time. Now, does that mean that this, all of these things can change? Um, at, at any time, yes, it, it, that's just the way markets are. Anything can change at any time. But we're back in an uptrend zone now. We've got buy sell ratio that is also showing some strength. We've got a crossover back up, which means we're back up above one on buy sell ratio. Remember what a market is. A market is just simply a group of uh, thousands and thousands of stocks. So you're getting thousands of stocks that are doing different things based on the underlying company itself and when you look at all of those stocks as a whole then that is a market so the so this represents the market as a whole it's another representation of the market there are lots of indices like the S&P 500 and the Russell 2000 and 3000 and 1000 and Wilshire 5000 and Nasdaq composite those are all just groupings indices of pulling all of those stocks into essentially a market so that we can keep an eye on what is what what are all of these stocks doing together and when we decide that and we determine that all of those are going up or all of those are going down, then we can create our bias. Okay, So the real long-term bias still is that, yeah, we're, we're in an uptrend. We know that. We also know we're towards the upper end of that uptrend. We also know that there's some really cool, fantastic technology being created right now that could really move the market higher. Is that going, it, is it going to create a speculative bubble? Yes, it, it, it always does. Anytime there's new, new technology, new ideas, it always creates a speculative bubble to the upside until that technology starts to prove itself with actual profits. So once we see profitability, once we see profits because of AI and chips, and the technology and the productivity, then well, then, then things can really get exciting. But right now, we're still kind of in this discovery phase of what companies are really going to benefit. How how are we as consumers really going to use the technology? Uh, how is the technology ultimately going to to benefit, um, you know, mankind? That that ultimately is going to that, that's still under question. Kind of like the internet boom, kind of like. Um, you know, cryptocurrencies, which are still relatively new and still trying to find its footing as well. We've got a lot of things happening in the world right now that are, that are all very exciting, in my opinion. Um, and, you know, buying these kind of quality names, buying stocks that are going up, that is essentially what the overall methodology is. So just, again, just as a little backtrack, what we're looking for primarily is we're looking for market conditions that are that are obviously going higher. When we get these counter trend moves, uh, stocks collapse. Almost all stocks collapse. These are harder. Uh, these are we can certainly buy into those. They're harder to trade in the shorter term. But for the vast majority of time, what we want to focus on are, are markets that are moving higher, which is most of the time. Markets are moving higher most of the time. They're not moving lower most of the time. So there's no sense in getting really, really sucked in by a lot of the fear mongering. 
uh, it's just it just is a th these are just normal ebbs and flows. These are just normal market situations, normal cycles, new technology, new you know new faces playing the same game, uh, and so it's you know can scary things happen? Certainly, we saw that back in the subprime mess where we had some systemic risk, where banks and brokers with these credit default swaps were doing really stupid things. Ultimately, we get more regulation, which sometimes helps, sometimes hurt, uh, and it just continues to move on. So we're looking, we, we wanna to continue to focus on good names that are moving higher. And we find those in these muscle scans, the new buy scans. For example, we've got NVIDIA. NVIDIA had that. We talked about it last year, last week, actually, when we were talking about how do we look for a possibility of, of a bounce? Where do we trade or how can we get into that bounce? Well, that's obviously panned out a lot faster than I would have anticipated, just slice through every one of these levels. but. Now, NVIDIA is back into that momentum zone. What's going to happen from here? Who knows, right? That, but it's 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 now we know that this that this company is is just firing on all cylinders. Whether the demand for their chips starts to slow, that's going to be the thing. Is if all the big heavy hitters, Microsoft, Google's, Amazon's, uh, are have have already gone through these capex spending cycles where they're spending a lot of money on these chips then at some point the the sales are going to slow it i don't think it's happening yet but it's going to happen at some point but it's in an uptrend once again and uh and that is what we can trust okay what we can trust is are, are these trend directions uh, and we just we just trade into those trend directions trying to capture one of these big moves there's always a possibility for whipsaw there's always a possibility that it moves up that it pulls one of these but typically, you know, after a decent counter trend move, and now you've got a lot of demand coming back in, it, it would have to really, you know, it would have to really drop the ball, or some economic indicators that are coming out would really have to be really ugly to to slow down this momentum. It's back into momentum, and that's ultimately what we want to focus on and find our stocks that are in momentum that are moving higher. Now, some of, some of the things that can bother us as traders are all of this and we and we can say oh man i should have would have could have whatever fill in the blank of you know of regret and 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 pain and the woulda coulda shoulda scenario of oh if i would have only bought at this price i would be profitable by this okay that's that 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 sometimes is helpful in the learning in the learning process obviously to recognize that you are now recognizing things that are happening like, oh, this happened and I could have done this versus I should have done this because the should haves are simply your, your strategy. You're not following your strategy that then if you if you should have, then why didn't you? Well, you didn't because you didn't have a method. OK, so if you're asking or saying I should have this or I should have that, then ask yourself why? Why should have I this or that? Because 2020 hindsight doesn't work. OK, 2020 hindsight is easy in the hindsight, it's harder in the moment. Okay, it's hard right now to say, where's it going from here? I don't know, you know, the trend and the momentum now is here, but could it roll back over? Yes, if so, I place a stop, I get out of the trade. None of us know the future, but we certainly can manage and maintain trends. And then we have, and then we implement the strategy based on what are we looking for? What are, what's our anticipation? Where can we set up our risk profile on this? Okay, I wanna buy NVIDIA right now, so what do I do? I set up my, I find what my risk is. I need to know how many shares can I buy to be inside of my acceptable portfolio at risk. 10 shares uh, on a $100,000 account would put me at a 1.22%. So if I went up to 18 shares, let's go to 16 shares, that's right around 2%. So in most cases, at least for the, the most of the money management approaches that we teach are to be right around that two to two and a half percent allocation. You can always increase that. And, and, and this is the adjustment that is made in order to take more risk or take less risk. Okay, if I want less risk, meaning less exposure to losses, okay, the only way to have zero risk is to not be invested at all okay the, and, and, the, and, and then from there it's about what how, how much risk am i taking well in this case i now know that if i bought 16 shares of nvidia with a hundred thousand dollar portfolio and all hell broke loose and the you know and the world came to an end and i would lose my 
$2,000. NVIDIA drops to zero, it goes bankrupt. I'm out $2,000. That's the absolutely worst case scenario for me to buy 16 shares of NVIDIA. Okay, I want to know that. I want to know that number because that's my starting point. My starting point is with my position size. Remember that position size is a risk is, is also a risk function. It's managing risk by not taking too big of a position. If you say, you know, ah, what the hell, let's do 100 shares and see what happens. Okay, I'm up, to, I got 12%, I got 12,000 at risk, and tomorrow something happens and they say, you know, there was a bombing in such and such and the supply chain is now cut off and Nvidia can no longer produce chips for the next 90 days. This stock is going to gap lower by 50%. And you're now out six thousand dollars because of some they call that a black swan a black swan is the out of the ordinary the out of the norm it's just something that couldn't that couldn't possibly be anticipated it couldn't even be expected it's a you know like uh like the uh, the indonesia tsunami back in 2005 that killed hundreds of thousands of people uh you know even even COVID, things that happen that are out of the anticipation they're just not even on people's radar that is what position sizing is for is to protect against that kind of a, of a situation okay if it is such a rare situation that you're thinking man jesse that's so rare i'm willing to take this kind of risk in order to try and get that higher that higher return with more money then, then great, then put it into your trading plan and say, I'm willing to take this kind of risk and I'm willing to take this kind of risk because of X, Y, Z. They don't just say, ah, it's, this is funny money and I'm going to just toss it at NVIDIA because everyone else is and I'm gonna buy into it. Have a, you know, have a method and approach to structure that risk. It's always the risk. It's, it's always the risk that is going to hurt you every single time. It's not going to be anything else. It's going to be the risk that you're taking, okay? Because every everything else is to the upside. Okay, the risk to the downside. How do we manage that? Is this is is this too big? Well, if it were to if it were to have an event that it lost, maybe gapped over my stop, you can certainly have this big of a position size and have a tighter stop. Okay. It's just that it's that one it's that one moment where I've got too big of a position and something gaps lower. Um, the probabilities are not super high for that. So you could take a little bit more risk, but you wanna make sure it's consistent. Make sure your risk management is the same consistently is my point. And in this case, you know, two, you, you could, you know, I like two to two and a half percent or even less right now towards the upper end of the market. If we're earlier in a trend, I would go with a little bit higher allocation right here. But let's go back to that. What do we say, 16 shares? 16 shares. Now, the second part of this that we want to talk about is our stop loss. What happens if it doesn't go higher? Okay, what happens if it starts to drop back down? What am I going to do at that point? Am I going to just, you know, close my eyes and say, ah, gosh dang it. Well, I'll just, you know, I'll wait. I'll just wait it out now and see what happens. This is NVIDIA, you know, it's going to go higher. And I think if it, if that's the approach and that's the long-term investment approach, that's also fine, as long as you're prepared for the amount of volatility that buying and holding onto a potential downtrend could uh, could create. Not, nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with any, with any strategy. It's just having a strategy and knowing what your risk is and knowing why you're entering, where you're entering, and what the amount of risk is that you're actually taking on a trade. So let's say that we've got 23, let's just set it pretty tight right here and say 20, 123 even on a stop loss. Okay, we go 125 on my stop here, or excuse me, 120. I meant to say 123. 123. That's really, really low risk. That's a really tight stop right there because it's only up a couple of percent. We could go a little bit deeper than that or not. We could say, ah, if it retraced and I had an even larger position and it retraced back to 123 and I get stopped out, then fine. That, that was my plan. Okay, if I want to go a little bit deeper, I typically like to go that size of position size and then and then a deep enough amount of risk that uh, that it's a you know it's a comfortable amount of volatility. So let's say 112. So let's go 112. Okay, 112 puts us at 0.24 right here. That 112 number is clear down here. So what I'm saying is if I bought here, I'm willing to allow the stock this much volatility it could come down it could come down it could retrace 
it could potentially find some support and then move higher. I want to give the stock enough room to do what it does, and that is create, you know, even in this downtrend here, you can see there's a there's an acceptable level of volatility and range. So on our uptrends, we know that we get these acceptable volatility ranges, and then we wait for the support and we watch for it to go higher. If that doesn't happen, then we need to stop out of that. Why? Because I said, I'm willing to risk 248 bucks on this trade. I'm to that point. I need to, I need to exit. I need to get out to protect my capital and not let this small loss turn into a large loss. Those are, those are really important points in terms of just the risk management. So pick a number that works. I say, if you're new or if you're, um, a little bit more risk averse, trade really small. If you're brand new, trade one share, okay? Buy one share, that's gonna cost $129, and then you can and then you can track it, okay? Then you can say, in this case, if I were to buy one share of NVIDIA, just so that I can get a little bit comfortable with the method, comfortable with my brokerage account, entering trades, following trades, building a portfolio, okay, I have $15 at risk if I'm stopped out of this trade on one share of NVIDIA. Okay, that's that that's you know I can learn on that I, and and not go broke. Okay, if I'm still understanding, trying to wanting to learn what I'm doing, and then what I have to do is I have to earn my position size. Okay, I've got to earn my position size and saying I don't know what I'm doing yet. I can't trade a full position size because I don't I don't I'm not comfortable with the execution of the of the actual trade. I need to make sure that I'm comfortable with that process. And in order to do that, I've got to earn a larger position size, okay, maybe more than that. But if this this is a great way to be able to, especially now with transaction costs, essentially nothing, you could buy a sh one share and then you know get stopped out of it. And and the ins and the outs of of trading anymore are relatively insignificant as far as transaction costs. And uh, and it's a great way to have real money on the line. Okay, I do like a lot of simulators and utilizing simulated trading because it does, it, it, it helps with the execution. It helps with the fundamentals of, I've got to enter this, I've got to go in, I got to know the buttons, I got to push, I got to enter, you know, just the, just the execution inside of a brokerage account um, and having a smaller amount at risk, okay? Uh, let me jump back. That, so that is essentially, you know, what we're looking for in these uptrends is we're looking for stocks. And most of the time, you know, as you're going in, obviously we can't buy every single stock in here. And we wanna have some kind of a filtering mechanism as well. And so a lot of times I'll use a confirmation bar and then increasing volume. Confirmation bar, the better the bar, the better the look of the bar. I've mentioned this before, an A grade bar, looks like this. It opens, it trades up all day long, and it closes right at the top. It looks just like that, excuse me, and it's on increasing volume. And it's at a location where you're getting a breakout of this resistance area here. Okay, That's enough information to be able to take a trade on a stock and say, I want to add that one into my portfolio. This one we actually did add in to the, this morning and say, okay, where's my stop loss here? I want to be able to set up a stop maybe down at that 155 level. So I'd set here, I'd go to this one. I have, uh, what's our price, 160. We're probably gonna be around the same number of shares as NVIDIA. Let's say 13 shares, that puts us at 2% and a stop loss down below this cluster of price activity, just down below this next zone. You can see how it got stuck inside of this zone with retracement and now it broke out above that. That's that stair-stepping motion that we wanna see. We wanna see it break up. Now we want to see it potentially retest, not a lot, ideally, and then it continues higher. So let's set the stop just below that location there at 155 and see what our risk looks like. That's 155, that's $188. So I'm risking $188 on this trade for the potential of more upside, that it's going to continue to advance in its trend. And this, and my entry process is now, uh, is now, is now systematic. Okay, I'm doing the same thing, different stocks, different day, different market conditions, but I'm doing it the same way each time so that I can so that so that I can understand the structure of any changes if I need to make those changes to say, man, I'm getting stopped out of a lot of trades. Well, okay, are we looking for stocks in the momentum zone? Ideally, we're in the momentum zone. Was it an ugly bar? Was it a, you know, maybe you have a let's see if we can find one here and 
uh, let's go through just a couple of muscle, uh, muscle stock uh, scans here and see if there was anything yesterday. This actually, this is an interesting stock also. Keep an eye on VKTX. It had a really big run. We caught a lot of this move. This was a huge trade for us. We exited into this and it hasn't been able to get moving since then. Lots of whipsaws and it's really trying, but for whatever reason, but now it's right at that deeper retracement, that one year time frame. Remember what this box represents, this 382 to 618 box of counter trend is a corrective zone. Okay, versus momentum. If it stays in momentum, it, it typically will continue from here. If it's already worked its way back into this corrective zone, now it's looking for a potentially you know, um, move even higher if it finds its footing right here. And the, so these are significant areas to keep an eye on and VKTX is, uh, is looking interesting it's a little bit deeper that six month time frame again there's a lot there's resistance to work to the upside but as those are starting you know you maybe we get up above that 71 dollar range and we say all right this thing is looking like it may want to go i was going to see if i could find a little bit uglier bar um but most of these new buys yesterday actually had there there we go even this this is a gap higher this is not an ideal looking bar you had a, a really big gap then you had a lot of a rally and then you had some selling happening really a choppy indecisive bar okay we want to have the most decisive looking bar that we can have and that is that solid confirmation bar going in in addition to increasing volume in addition to momentum zone and a rank ideally a rank above 90 really a rank above 80, you're gonna be acceptable. And so you can create additional screens here. I've got some screens. I've got one here that's a new buy on volume. So all of these new buys have got big volume or increased significant volume over the prior day. So VKTX actually had a really big solid confirmation bar on big volume. ALT, this is another one. This is a, a similar type of pattern. Deep retracement had a big run up last year or early in the year retraced and just a ton of whipsaw. Okay, and this is where, this is why I like that momentum zone um, for the most part is you get less of these. You do get some, but you get less of the resistance once it's had a deeper correction. What's interesting too about strong stocks or leading stocks is they, you know, they, for a really long-term trend, you know, and you have the NVIDIAs uh, right now, but even in these shorter-term trends, when they retrace and they and they try to come back, the, they, they're not the same leading stocks. They're not the same stocks that are leading right now. And so that's also something to be aware of is if you see a stock that's been working really well and it did work and all of a sudden it's not working, then don't fight it because it, because that's normal. Every new trend, even in an, even in a normal trend cycle, where we're seeing some of these trend cycles going from, you know, just from just from these, from bearish to bullish, from bearish to bullish, all within an overall uptrend. The leaders in each of these bullish cycles are probably going to be different each time as well, uh, and we'll try to be able to take advantage of of those as they're happening. Um, a little bit different. I uh, didn't spend too much time today going over really the market conditions, other than the fact that we're just looking better across the board. We've got S&P 500. We did look at that. We, let's look at bonds quickly here on the six-month time frame. We're continuing to see SHY improving, which is what we want to see. We want to see that SHY. That's the shorter-term treasury continuing to move higher. That'll be in anticipation of lower interest rates coming back down. And then we also have TLT, which is continuing to work here as well, moving higher. That's looking good. Uh, stocks are looking good. Uh, sectors are also improving here. We've got we've got no red now. We've got all short-term trends moving higher. Okay, we've got commodities. We've got gold moving higher, which is uh, which is one of the things you know. Whether we want to see it or not, it, you know, gold has been breaking out to new highs. It's it's a tradable asset class. Uh, and to be aware of. Same with silver. USO has been dropping fine by me, as I've mentioned. The USO can continue to drop. So we're seeing USO drop, which is oil dropping, interest rates uh, dr potentially dropping as we're seeing bonds moving higher. Okay, all positive things for stocks right here. So we've got really, a, 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 as of right now, you know, a, a nice looking scenario for uh, stocks to continue this overall uptrend. 
unless we get re, you know some other really odd news. There is some FOMC minutes. There's some uh, some Fed discussion from Jackson Hole. There's some things coming up this week that potentially could spook the market, and we still want to maintain a little bit lower allocation, in my opinion, because of where we're at in this trend. Yes, we're deep into this trend, but I still am sticking right around that. Uh, 20, you know, 25% allocation. So now we've got a few of these holdings. ASTS has been a really nice big mover, continuing to break out and pulling back a little bit here as well. That's our biggest winner so far uh, in, a, in the last little while. But each of these that we've been adding into our gold stock, NGD, having some nice com uh, continuation there as well. And keeping those position sizes, keeping the allocation to equities around that 25 to 30 percent is about where I'm going to continue to, to go. But remember what the the market helps us determine those position sizes. Why? Because we don't get stopped out of anything. As we're continuing to allocate into a new stock each day, which is re referred to as the wheel methodology, we're adding into those. And some of these we're going to start taking profits. Some of them will get stopped out. So and and you know, but some of these will just keep moving and moving. We'll hang on to the ones that win. We'll rotate out of the ones that are losing or lagging. And uh, and if market conditions start to flatten or roll back down again, then we can ease out of some of those positions. Uh, but as but if we're not stopped out and we're adding into new positions, this 25% might turn to 30%, maybe a little bit more than that. And then we and then we've got to decide, hey, we don't we're not getting stopped out of anything. How do we want to manage the trades? Do we want to sell out of some of our winners? Do we want to rebalance some of those? Do we want to cut some of the losers? Those are all exit strategies as well for uh, for port, uh, the portfolio management. I'm going to end on that note and appreciate everyone's time and effort and we'll see you all next time. Thanks a lot. Bye now.